Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. My name is Jeremy Nettles. I am the evangelist for the River Ridge Church of Christ in Newburgh, Indiana. We're going to be doing our first examination of one of Paul's letters. In previous installments, we have used the arrangement of the canon, and we have looked at the, the first of each category. So the first book of law was Genesis, the first book of history was Joshua. For the letters, I think it makes more sense to go through them chronologically. We've actually already started this. We looked at James not too long ago, and James was written before any of Paul's letters, probably before any of the Gospels was written, and certainly before Acts was written. But this week, with Galatians, I'm stepping into a bit of a controversy in saying that it's the, the first of Paul's letters, although you've probably never heard of this controversy before. But here's the basis of the confusion. Where is Galatia? And when did Paul preach there? The answers to those questions are not crucially important to our understanding of the book, but they are important to understanding when Paul wrote it, and that in turn is going to have some effect on how we read it, or at least what we're expecting to see and what we get out of it, not on the most basic level. It's not going to change the, the fundamental doctrine that Paul is preaching, but the nuance, the subtleties. If you look at the maps in the back of your Bible, then you'll see some disagreement, perhaps. For example, this map here is in the back of one of my Bibles. This Bible was printed in 1973 by the Dixon Company, and you see where Galatia is? Okay, let's look at another one. Here's a Thompson from 1997. Pretty much the same, right? Okay, here's another 97 model. This is a New American Standard Bible from Foundation Publications. And there's no real difference, although uh, it's clearly much more cheaply produced than those other two. Here is a gloriously ugly map from a 1989 Nelson King James Bible. Uh, oh, the 80s. Well, it's still the same thing, isn't it? And you may be noticing that Paul doesn't seem to be going there, at least on his first or second missionary journey. Okay, here's one from a 2001 United Bible Society's map. This time, you'll notice a couple of little blips into the territory that's called Galatia, and they are listed on Paul's second and third journeys. So what's the deal? Why do some of the maps have nothing as far as Paul going there, and others do have Paul going there, and particularly on the second and third journeys? Well, let's begin in Acts chapter 16. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. This is Paul and Timothy and Silas and company. They are going about on their second missionary journey. It says that they went through Galatia. So, okay, early on in the second journey, that's when they went. In chapter 18, verse uh, 23, we'll see something like this again. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Same place names, same region. Uh, this is not the second journey anymore. This is the third journey, but it's his, his outbound trip, just like before. He left from Antioch, and he went to Galatia and Phrygia, and then he went on after that. Galatians tells us clearly that it was sent shortly after Paul established churches there. So, we probably don't need to worry about that second one, which would be the third journey, but in chapter 16, in his second journey, it says that he went through Galatia. Here's where the trouble starts to kick in. Where is Galatia? Didn't we cover that already? I mean, I just showed you all these maps. Okay, well, let me show you a few more. But first, a question. Where's Louisiana? That's right, you guessed it, the entire western two-thirds of North America. Wait a second, that can't be right. Louisiana is much smaller than that. I mean, here's the, the Wikimedia Commons map, and it's just a comparatively tiny little region at the mouth of the Mississippi River. But on this map from 1804, this whole thing was called Louisiana. While we're at it, note that Florida extends all the way to the Mississippi, where I'm quite sure both Alabama and the state now called Mississippi border on the Gulf of Mexico. North New Mexico isn't just the northern half of today's state New Mexico, but it seems to include all of Texas and substantial portions of Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. 
And California is called New Albion, while to the south, what we now call Baja California, is just plain old California. The point is that regional names like these shift dramatically over time due to politics, migration, convention, and other factors. So why does this matter to us? Well, as time went on, the name Galatia referred to different things. Like most place names, it originally had to do with an ethnic group, the Gauls in this case. So Galatia referred to the general area inhabited by this ethnic group. You can see how this would lead to some pretty blurry borders. But the slightly later Roman provincial border, which is a political division, not just an ethnic one, went much farther south than what we have seen so far on our maps. And this probably reflects the common usage at the time. What this means is that when Paul took his very first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, shown here on this map, the area where he spent the most time by far was in the southern part of the region of Galatia. But instead of calling it that, Luke mentions the specific names of the towns, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. He calls a couple of them cities of Laconia, but that smaller region, which you've seen on several maps already, is part of the broader area known as Galatia, in the same way that Evansville is part of the tri-state area, and the Ohio River Valley, and Indiana, all at the same time. Why does all of this matter? I keep asking this, and it seems like we're not quite getting to the answer yet. Well, it matters for a couple of reasons. First, it tells us that Paul wrote this letter shortly after his first missionary journey, during the time when the Gentiles as Christians debate was its hottest, and we should read the letter with that in mind. Second, it helps us to understand some of the events in question better. It helps us to establish the order in which Paul wrote these letters. It tells us that Paul continued to visit the churches addressed in this letter in the, the four towns on each successive mission trip. And it proves conclusively that this map is wrong. All right, that last one isn't all that important, but the other points are. Now then, with the historical background established in some detail, let's get into the letter itself. I'd like to go through Galatians with you twice. The first time through, we'll talk about the fact pattern that it establishes, what happened among these churches. The second time we go through, we'll talk more about the lessons it teaches us today. Okay, let's start with round one. Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. They're leaving the faith? Well, sort of. They are falling for an imitation. As far as they're concerned, they're still Christians and they're still behaving as Christians, but they're being led astray. The rest of chapter one is spent making it clear that what Paul preached to them wasn't just Paul's own interpretation of the facts or of some sort of mystical hoodoo. It was straight from God, verse 11. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul establishes this gospel's independence even from the church at Jerusalem. He's saying that they're not the ones who get to decide. And he says that when he himself was converted, he did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. 
That was almost as boring as my long-winded explanation of the history of regional labels. Why is Paul wasting our time with all this? What he said back in verse 11, not man's gospel. He's trying to convince these Christians that his message was not from any earthly source, but from heaven. Chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seemed to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me, God shows no partiality, those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. Paul's a wee bit upset, isn't he? Well, he has a right to be. These supposed Christians have been causing trouble over the Jew-Gentile issue. And now, this passage is, believe it or not, the stickiest point in the controversy over when Galatians was written. If you're familiar with Acts, you might tack this meeting in Jerusalem here in chapter 2 to Acts 15, and then go on about your merry way. But based on what we have concluded already, that meeting hadn't happened yet. Paul wrote this letter between getting home from journey number one in Acts 13 and 14 and going down to Jerusalem for the confrontation in Acts 15. Really, it makes a lot of sense. If Acts 15 had already happened, why doesn't Paul appeal to the decision made there? and say to these poor deluded folks, see, it's obvious that all the apostles agree on this point. Here's the letter that they sent out to disavow the doctrine that has led you astray. But he doesn't do that, because that meeting still lies in the future at the time of his writing. This clearer understanding of what's been going on helps us to understand with much greater clarity the scope of the Jew-Gentile divide in the early decades of the church. It began in Acts chapters 10 and 11 with Peter and Cornelius. Jesus himself told Peter to go preach the gospel to Cornelius, a Gentile. Peter had to defend himself before these, basically these same people in Jerusalem after that happened. You can see Paul already involved in the controversy in his involvement at Antioch at the end of Acts 11. You can see it looming in the background in Acts 13 and 14 on Paul's first missionary journey as Barnabas and Saul gives way in Luke's writing to Paul and Barnabas. Here in Galatians, we see additional details about the disagreement. Then there's Acts 15, and finally it seems to pretty much go away. Chapter 2, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Yikes! For those who might not know, Cephas is Peter, the apostle, like the guy who was basically the main character for the first third or so of Acts. Here Paul is rebuking him. What else does Paul say about himself in all this? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Not only does this give Paul's personal perspective, but it introduces the main doctrinal thrust of this letter. But in any case, we've really only hinted at the nuts and bolts of the problem among the Galatian churches. It's clear that it has to do with Jews resisting Gentile acceptance into the church, but how precisely? Chapter 5. 
For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Someone, apparently professing to speak both for Paul and for the higher-ups at Jerusalem, has convinced many of these Galatian Christians that they must keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. In particular, they're being convinced that they need, over and above Christ's expectations, to be circumcised. Paul, who is himself circumcised, is standing firm against this. Does that mean it's a sin to be circumcised or to circumcise your son? No. But if you think it'll have any relationship at all to eternal salvation, then you're sorely mistaken. He finishes off all of this with some excellent instructions about what they should be focusing on rather than the particular ways that sharp tools might interact with their bodies. We'll come back to those in our second run-through in a moment here, but that phrasing makes me think of something else, which will serve to bridge the gap, I hope. Do we have any issues like this today? Yes, we most certainly do. There were self-righteous people trying to require a procedure invasive to their fleshly bodies and telling them that it was their duty before God to comply. Today, there are self-righteous people trying to require a procedure invasive to our fleshly bodies and telling us it is our duty before God to comply. In their case, it was circumcision. In our case, it's vaccination. Now, several things can be true at once. Vaccination and circumcision, for that matter, can be valuable. Paul himself says over in Romans 3, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Aside from the oracles of God bit, the same could be said of the COVID vaccination. What value is it? Much in every way. Does that make it wrong to get the vaccine? Well, no, no more than it's wrong to be circumcised. But the motivations can be a problem, as can the assumption that it's a requirement of God and has a direct bearing on your salvation. And then even worse is binding that personal conviction on everybody else. That is crazy. And yet, it's not just a political question. It has shown up in the churches, too. As with everything about this whole virus ordeal over the past couple of years, the conclusions and opinions have been all over the board, many very wrong-headed at both extremes. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? Okay, that's not the main lesson for us to get from Galatians, though. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Is Paul trying to say that he is the only authoritative source of truth in the world? No, not at all. The point is that the message was not from Paul. As he said in chapter 1, verse 11 as well, it is not man's gospel. It occurs to me that there are a handful of putatively Christian denominations and even entire religions out there today who subscribe to supposed additional revelations, including from angels, that say what Paul preached wasn't the whole story. What would this litmus test indicate about those additional revelations exactly? The really important doctrinal stuff is what follows. Let's reread chapter 2, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. 
Paul is not saying here that your actions don't matter in any way, shape, or form. He's also not saying that you have no free will or no ability to make the conscious choice to do what's right. If that were the case, then why would he later say in chapter 5, verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Sounds pretty labor-intensive if you ask me. And he is clearly stating there that if your works are the works of the flesh, then you are putting yourself at odds with God. But he is demonstrating, first of all, that the works of the law are insufficient for salvation. For example, oh, I, I don't know, let's say... Uh, circumcision. And second, as he says in chapter 3, verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. This is about inclusion in God's chosen people, the nation of descendants promised to Abraham. That meant Israel, of course, but God plans ahead. He also meant, more importantly, that he would open the doors for the Gentiles to become children of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. It's about genuine faith, which James has already told us is active. What counts is faith working through love. If you say you have faith, but there's no love and no works, well, that's going to be a problem. What good is that faith? If you say you have the works, but there's no faith and there's no love, what good are all those works? If you say you have the love, but there's no faith and there's no works, then what good is that love? Are any of these real? Okay, a few more lessons for us to take away. We read the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit already, but let's hit it again. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That sounds like a pretty awful list of some pretty awful people, but they're pretty common, aren't they? Sexual immorality. Do we have to go into detail about how widespread that is? That is a real pandemic. Sensuality. Now, this isn't a, a purely sexual connotation, although that is included. It's not really the main focus. But the idea is the appeal to the senses and to pleasing the senses in general. Yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, American society today. Idolatry. All right, it doesn't take the same form today, but eh, people choose something or other to worship. Sometimes it's their electronics, sometimes it's their sports, sometimes it's their government, sometimes it's themselves, sometimes it's something else entirely, but everybody picks a god. The question is whether it's the real god or a fake. Enmity is the next one on the list. Have you looked at our politics lately? Strife. See previous item. Jealousy. Same goes. You know what? Let's just uh, include fits of anger and rivalries and dissensions and divisions and envy under this heading as well. That'll speed things up. They could be expanded considerably, but a glance at the political discourse today tells us that, uh, well, it tells us that all of these things are unfortunately alive and well in our society. Drunkenness. 
especially if you widen the scope to intoxication in general, with all the drugs that Paul could have only imagined at the time, well, that seems to be more and more accepted by the day. And the point is, this isn't a list of the absolute worst of the worst of human conduct. This is a list of the norms in human conduct. Left to our own devices, we default to pleasing the flesh. And this stuff is what pleases the flesh, at least for the short term, which is all the flesh really cares about anyway. And what does Paul say about practitioners of these behaviors? Verse 21 again, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Cultivate these instead. Not just happy thoughts, but behaviors, fruit in your life of the Spirit. Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires, as he says in verse 24. That is easier said than done. We're going to have to work at it. We're going to have to work on being faithful. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. What do we get out of Paul's letter to the Galatian churches? Well, I hope an awful lot. There's much for us to gain. Knowing the long-standing conflict about the Gentile question within the church makes this letter all the more forceful and all the more meaningful. We also saw that it applies to us a little more directly than we might have liked. I would never have predicted that it could provide this kind of direct application to today. Oh, how silly those foolish Galatians were thinking that an elective medical procedure could be required for their salvation from everlasting damnation. But it turns out silliness and folly are with us today as well. And finally, we saw at least the beginnings of the realization that we are powerless to earn our salvation. We've already sullied ourselves, and we can no longer stand before God and claim to be righteous. There is a debt to be paid, and we don't have the assets to cover it. It required the sacrifice of a perfectly accountable yet unblemished life. And although we were unable to provide one of these, Jesus had one he was willing to part with. We can't pay the debt. We can't earn a spot in heaven. We can't repay him. But we can faithfully work through love and follow his example of crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires and put on Christ, as Paul says in chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you need to put on Christ and start living faithfully, we encourage you to reach out to us at River Ridge and we'll be happy to help you take the next steps. You can reach us at 812-550-6234 or info at riverridgechurch.org to ask us your questions or sign up for a study, or you can find us on Facebook or YouTube to find out more. You can also join us at 5600 Van Road in Newburgh for 10 a.m. Sunday worship. We'd love to see you there. Thanks for joining me today on Iron Sharpens Iron.